Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. All right. Let us. All right. Good morning. Uh, you know, folks' names are up in uh, in front of their images, so I will not I will not worry about introducing everybody. We've become much less formal in our defenses in recent years, and that is a, uh, a development much to be praised. Um, we are here this morning for the. Uh, MFA thesis defense is what it is officially called, although what uh, Ismail is presenting to us is neither a thesis nor does he have to defend it. Uh, it is, you know, I, I will unabashedly say that it is well worth the uh, earning of the degree of Master of Fine Arts uh, in Fiction from SIU. And so this is really a more uh, uh, a, a capstone presentation and a moment for us to uh, appreciate the work of our good friend Ismail and to uh, to celebrate the time that he has spent here at SIU and the achievements that he has uh, made while he is here. Um, and so we will we will move directly into that. And you know, as I say, you know, folks are who are on the panel more than welcome to interrupt at any time to ask any questions that. Um, seem uh, germane to you or even that don't seem germane and that are perhaps entirely unreasonable. Um, those are the sorts of questions I much prefer. I will uh, openly try to derail Ismail <laughs> at least a couple of times during the, uh, 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 because that, you know, that's that's the sort of test the world throws at us. Um, but uh, this is, I've been, I've been anticipating this defense for quite some time now because it is, uh, um, we, we have a, a delightful hour or so uh, uh, in front of us. So um, let me go back into the peanut gallery and boom. Okay, Ismail, regale us with hey. tales. Yeah, well, I mean, I kind of like have all my favorite people that were around me like for three years. I'm kind of like excited. It's kind of like look at my work and like my time at SIU, not even kind of like my degree or my work, I just kind of like look at Rev and like PK and you, uh, Pinkney, kind of like think about all these projects and like these kind of like small tidbits of like how it grew, how much I got rejected, looking at the sample that I submitted for the MFA and laughing, <laughs> laughing at myself, <laughs> like how did they even get me there? That kind of like all these, these kind of like, um, to me, it feels like a journey, obviously. It feels like um, such an interesting journey coming from the background that I had. Um, kind of like starting a life in finance and politics, working for the Palestinian government, going to Oxford, doing all these crazy things. And then I find myself in Carbondale. I'm like, what am I even doing with my life in Carbondale? And it, it kind of like, to me today, feels like a, a moment of reflection on the work that I've done and kind of like how much I grew and how much I feel kind of like I'm finally marrying all these things that I believe in together and I feel like looking at you Pinkney and PK and Rav kind of like seeing all these different aspects about my writing and how they come together in that sense so my project obviously like you know hopefully you read it if you haven't read it that's fine too you know it doesn't matter but what, what matters today is seeing these different themes that I talk about that I've always talked about memory politics um, government all these kind of things coming together you know in a project where like I feel like it feels closer to me, it feels like a voice finally coming out of me that perhaps the finance or the politics did not really give me. And I feel like fiction in that sense has been kind of like that vehicle that transported all these ideas that I've had in mind and put them together for me to make my voice in a sense. Coming from obviously Palestine, the West Bank, growing up there, um, the situation is obviously very tangled up with Israel and Palestine, the conflict, the opposing kind of like ideas of what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad, what God wants from them and what God wants from us. All these kind of questions that we've always been entangled with have been many points kind of like washed away by the realities, the harsh realities that we, um, we face in that sense. 
So coming up with these questions, trying to answer them within a setting, a realistic setting that does not necessarily take, uh, by, although I am biased being a Palestinian, attempts to be unbiased and creates a picture that brings those two worlds together. That's kind of like what I tried with. My biggest inspiration has always been Callan McCann's Aprigon. If you haven't read it, it's an amazing work of fiction, a work of nonfiction. Um, it talks about two, two families, Palestinians and Israelis, and the loss of a family member and how they come together. Now, the understanding is that not to paint, to paint wash this or like to create an idea that this is all lovey and dovey and this is peaceful. This is a harsh reality. This is a reality where people are being murdered and killed. This is an oppressive regime in a sense where it's in military occupied territories. So the lives are not to be, you know, the kind of like marrying those two families together is not to be taken as an attempt to soften the blow of what's happening. It is a chance for us to really reflect on what matters and what we can do as individuals to kind of like patch the work that has been always a problem when it comes to Palestine and Israel. Obviously, this is a topic that polarizes a lot of people and my intention is not to exclude. I've always said this and I've always did this in my writing. Obviously, I'm, bi I'm biased by being a Palestinian, but my job is to not uh, prevent people from joining the conversation. My job has always been to bring in everyone to make them at least feel comfortable and heard, but give them reality and a peace of my mind in that sense. So that's kind of like what I think about when I think about my fiction. Um, so yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay, if if you don't have anything, we can jump in and talk about. Oh, this is this is your show. We yeah. will uh, perfect. <laughs> we will interrupt as we uh, awesome as we as we cool. see fit. But this is cool. this is the uh, Ismail show. Perfect. So. I, I mean, if you know anything about me, obviously, I'm not totally in the arts. I am definitely, I definitely have the finance business background, startups, um, fundraising, all that kind of stuff, which which I love. Uh, it's an aspect of me that I feel like it just brought me into that in this work and kind of like made me think about it. So what I'm what I'm preparing for you today is like a pitch deck. I'm preparing this if I'm kind of like you know if I wanted to like you know fundraise for a company, this is basically what I would use. So I was like, I'm already know this. Kind of process so let's see what happens so um hopefully by now you know the name which is St steel room therapy ltd this is basically my baby i've been working on it for a while um i've been kind of like imagining it reimagining it and i've always kind of like what brought me to siu um siu's mfa were these questions what if black mirror william <laughs> since the peripheral <laughs> And George Orwell's 1984 had a baby. And what if that baby had a secret crush on Ted Chang's exhalation? Hell yeah. That's kind of like what <laughs> I've always had in mind. And like, you know, just knowing myself, I'm always into memory, like how memory works. I'm always into the peripheral teleportation and portals and like how people kind of like can transport from place to place, digital cities. And also the aspect about Palestine and Israel. And I thought George Orwell by far has always been like a writer that spoke to me, right, has always spoke to me because the whole reality is growing up um, and living in Palestine. I felt like this was like a, an Orwellian nightmare in a sense. Um, and Ted Chang's is just thoughtfulness, thoughtfulness when it comes to technology and like how gentle kind of like he braids real life with technology. And, I'm, and I feel like that kind of reality is to me makes steel room therapy in a sense. All these things coming together creates this project that I'm presenting to you today. So um, what is it about, really? So it's a sci-fi project. It's set up in the future, spanning across Palestine, Israel, the United States, and the digital city of Chicago. So and, and if someone just comes to me, and I'm getting in this elevator, and someone's like, well, what is it really about, right? It's just simply about a father who's stuck in grief, and he needs to break from it. That's it. This is exactly what the story is about, a father who's stuck in grief, and how he needs to just break free from it. Now, let's get into the nitty gritty details. This is more of a log line than synopsis, right? And this is kind of like the genre that I'm working with. The genre is rites of passage, thanks to PK. I can speak that language now and like learn about all these things because I definitely feel like PK's uh, workshops and beat sheet and all these kind of like stuff that we work together on 
has definitely helped me to acquire the language and speak kind of like how these things work. So I'm going to read the log line and talk about how the rites of passage work with that in terms of a genre. And then we can kind of like, feel free to interrupt me. This is kind of like an open space. So whatever you think about, just shoot it at me. So in the digital city of Chicago, Mustafa, a bereaved Palestinian father working as a disguised Israeli escort. But when he makes a bold move and threatens the life of a powerful client's wife, Mustafa's world is turned upside down. His job is now in jeopardy, and with it, his access to the only remaining piece of his son, a digital copy of his memories. Despite desperate to keep his job, Mustafa agrees to undergo a rehabilitation program, an experimental AI therapy treatment called Steel Room Therapy LTD. But as he delves deeper into the therapy, the painful traumas of his past come to life, threatening to shatter both his long-term memories and his son's digital existence for good. Will he choose to save his son's digital existence or will he risk losing it all for the chance to hold on to his long-term memories? The fate of Mustafa's past and his future hang in the balance and he must make a choice before it's too late. This is kind of like the log line. This is kind of like my go-to when I think about it. Obviously, jump in if there's anything on your mind. Um, my understanding of how my story works in terms of the genre itself, rites of passage. So when we think about rites of passage, for people who don't know that, it's basically um, when life gets in the way kind of genre. Like Black Snyder always says it, like it's when life gets in the way. It's problems that happen out of our control, death, separation, breakup, heartache, all these kind of things that we human go through and we have no control over. We can't hedge it. So, and what's interesting about this genre, it gave me a vocabulary for how the story works. There are different beats that work for my story that align with this genre. The first one is basically a life problem, which is the death of the son and Mustafa being stuck in grief. The second one is a way, a wrong way of solving the problem. So instead of Mustafa getting unstuck of grief, he's been holding on to this digital copy of his son and memories, and he won't let go. And that I mean, I'm sure you've read the stuff. It really created a hostile environment in his family, a neglectful environment where he's not present for his family. Now, the third beat, which is a solution for that problem to get unstuck that involves an acceptance of a hard truth, which is your son died and you need to move on. This is kind of like what represents this genre in my mind. And I feel like my story in a way creates like a... a a decent habitable environment for all of these elements to like grow out of it. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And Ismail, I'm wondering, I, so I did read your, uh, the thesis you sent. Um, and I'm wondering actually about the, at least I read most of it. And I'm wondering about the um, format of it because you've done all this this work with PK, which is great. You know, the log line, you have the beat sheet, you have all this cool stuff um, that's so helpful in pitching it. And I'm curious about the text itself because it was it was not written in screenplay form. Absolutely. It was not written in screenplay format. How, like, what was that format? Yeah, absolutely. So this is kind of like the idea um, I remember back in um, December when I was talking to Pinkney about the fact that I'm not comfortable with what I've been writing so far before, the idea of text being chunky and you can't chop it up and you can't move it around. And I feel like this has been always a problem with me trying to fix and edit my work. So the whole idea, even though I present them as episodes, the whole idea was writing scenes. So instead, and I, and I understand, understand my formatting is closer to a novel, but the whole idea with talking Pinkney about it was like, come up with scenes that can be easily shifted around that we can write the story again. I feel like the idea of just being stuck with text, whether it's a screenplay or whether it's a novel in a way, it really gets in the way of editing for me at this stage. And that's why coming up with scenes that can be easily translated into a thesis, whether it's like a screenplay pilot or a first three chapters of a novel, that would be very easy for me to translate. Gotcha. Do you do you plan going one way or the other? Do you plan going screenplay or a novel? I'm actually going to go both ways. So, oh, nice. yeah, like kind of like the idea of I think the truth is like uh, I think what I've learned a lot from PK's class is like pilot is very important. A lot of times yeah. I'm going to use this pilot. 
I'm going to take the first episode and make a pilot out of it and use that to go into competition, a lot of competition that Peru shared with us, uh, festivals, all that kind of stuff, do the work on that side, but at the same time, create the novel hand in hand. So my hope is to like increase my chances of like getting this accepted somewhere um, by having like double forces going at it at the same time. So instead of waiting for a novel to be done, I'm just taking a pilot and seeing if the pilot gets, because obviously like I don't really need to write beyond the pilot. Um, the pilot is the right. most important thing. And then, you know, like if they like it enough, they'll ask for more. But the pilot to me sounds like a very interesting um, format that I can use and can translate it also into a novel if I want to. Cool. Thank and you. It's, it's, it, it, it's also possible now, and we haven't discussed this, Ismail, because it's only become obvious to me very recently. Like my world changes day by day and hour by hour. But you know, we could easily create an AI tool that would that would take whatever you've written and you know drop it into whatever format you yeah. wanted for it yeah. and i mean of course you, you know you'd have to do a lot of the the revision by hand right. um right. but but it could do that mass work and make good decisions uh you know that kind of thing and that's that's going to become i think more and more um the default for the way we work is that we will create the the we will create the body of work and then when you know when you decide on a format you'll be able to to have a, a a digital assistant help you render it into the the format that you want um, and that's not far away at all like that's that's the kind of tool i could write over the course of you know a, a, right. a few days right no absolutely i th i think kind of like the the whole idea of um writing scenes that move the plot that are important to the plot that, that we can see them unfolding in front of us cinematically is something that um, all of your classes have definitely like helped me move towards it. And I feel like that was also lacking in my writing before. And that's kind of like where I saw the opportunity of writing scenes and seeing where I can take them from there. But you're absolutely right, Pinkney. I, I've definitely experimented with ChatGPT and wrote with ChatGPT a lot of the stuff and which, which honestly like opens up the world. Um, especially for scene settings and like description. Oh, you wrote, did you use chat GPT for what you sent? Um, so like scene settings sometimes. Okay. Like, so like, you know, scene settings and stuff like, you know, for the world building, obviously. Oh, okay. Yeah. It, it really, it, what's interesting about it is like giving it prompt regarding, because what I, I, I guess kind of like, I'm, I'm redefining my relationship with chat GPT every couple of days. I'm serious. It's been like an obsession, <laughs> which is basically now I'm just thinking about an, like an uh, I don't know if you watched Seinfeld before, right? Mm -hmm. And George, when George got like a secretary, and the secretary is better than him, and she gets the raise more than him, and I felt like that's kind of like what happens to me. Like I'm I'm George right now, and the secretary is getting paid more than me, and like working for me, and I'm like, why are you working for me? So <laughs> that's that's kind of like where I am right now. Kind of like saying I I I think of this as an, an as like a really smart personal assistant that is for free thanks to Pinkney, um, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, in that sense, kind of like working on scene settings because obviously I thought world building has been always an issue with me and like figuring out how to make that unique, make that work is still kind of like ahead of me because obviously for this draft what I focused on was mainly plot. I'm sure mm -hmm. you can tell. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Is Ismail, does that mean when you're when you're going through, you're going to choose a particular verb tense? Because I was curious whether, you know, in script writing we stay in present tense. And I noticed that um when I read the thesis, it was in past tense. So I was just curious what what form it would take when it went to either um either piece. Yeah. And and that's totally uh fair PK. I think uh, I'm kind of like wrapping my mind around my POV. And I feel like as I'm speaking, I'm really delighted that I've sent a couple pieces out there and I got, and I'm going to get published. So I'm really happy about a couple acceptances. So like, this is really awesome. And I'm kind of like figuring out my voice and I feel like present tense has been present tense has been third close present tense has been, I feel like has been my thing. And, and kind of like thinking about the format in terms of uh, the screenplay, obviously it's going to be following, following it to the T. 
right? Like in terms of like the, the tense, in terms of the format, in terms of like the scene settings, in terms of like showing, not telling, because obviously you're right. The way this is uh, formatted right now is closer to a novel and a story than uh, episodes 100%. But to me, I feel like what, what made me do that is because I want scenes. I felt like, you know, I, I didn't understand. And I feel like we talk about this a lot with, with, PK, with, with Pinkney and Rav's class, even right now in the workshop, moving the story, where do these scenes like start and end? And kind of like, that's kind of, if you looked at the breaks in that formatting, why did I break the way I break? It was because I'm, I was trying to think about setting and scene and how the scene and how we move through setting and scene. Where do we start and where do we end? And then that's kind of like what I had in mind, but I don't think I thought further than that. Okay. And I also saw that it was a pilot and then three episodes, but typically when we have a season, we have 10 episodes. Right. And then those 10 episodes are going to fulfill each beat of the beat sheet itself, right? Yes, absolutely. So I'm assuming that you're going to keep yes. going or it's going to be parceled out in a different sort of way, right? And I already have like two more episodes ready. Um, so my, my goal is to really, I think kind of like it's a, it's a, it's a, it might sound a bit like stingy, but it's kind of like my understanding of like my art when I put my time. I think I have now a solid five episodes of this. And my goal is like before I get car too carried away, uh, with it in terms of like if I want to actually show it to people I want to make sure that the pilot gets done really well <clears throat> like taking going back to the pilot make sure the pilot is like stellar it translates uh, showing not telling actual scenes writing it in the proper POV in the proper format the proper tense in the proper you know settings and scene settings and then take that pilot but you're absolutely right Right now, I have five episodes, and they do follow exactly what you said. They do follow the beat sheet. So if you looked at what, um, I think, act two, basically. So I'm like, um, I think what I sent you so far is roughly half of the TV show. So I, I, think, I think I have two more. Maybe, like, I, maybe it won't come, back, come out to 10, but I think it will come out to around seven episodes. Seven, maybe, maybe eight, depending on how... Um, I do it, but roughly, I think right now it's around seven or eight in my mind. So Ismail, I'll say this, the content is amazing. Like, and I remember when you workshop this in my class this semester, the Mustafa's narrative, like grieving over Kwasim. Yeah. Kwasim, grieving over his son's death and then having this kind of like really fraught relationship with like having to like pretend to be an Israeli man you know what I mean, and work with Yair, and, like, that's, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, right, is so, like, looms so large, kind of, like, in, in this story, um, and you deal with it in such, like, lovely, you know, metaphorical ways, um, but when I was reading your thesis, I did, the reason I, like, I had trouble getting through it as it is, you know what I mean, like, I had a hard time getting through it as it is, and I, I would have, I saw it going more in the screenplay direction and right. what you gave me for class more going in the novel direction. Absolutely. So like, I, I feel like I would have just digested it, been gone through it, zoomed through it if I'd had it in that screenplay format. But right now it does feel like it's more like your shorthand. Right. I yes. mean, um, which is what you intended. And I totally get that. Mm -hmm. I just would love to see, you know, you get to that point where you're you're writing in those two different forms and so you have what you gave for my class and then you have those screenplays because this Absolutely. this was like a new kind of form of writing and it was a, it was a it was a challenge for me it was mm -hmm. a challenge for me to get through so i um yeah i'm excited for you to kind of take it in those those new directions yeah. Absolutely. It's a, it's a crosswalk. I definitely handed a, my, my project right now feels like a crosswalk. And yeah. where, where do you take that from? Because I, I feel like, you know, translating into a novel would be much easier at this point. But, right. but obviously, because the narrative obviously is done in, in, in a, it's prosaic, right? Like, you know, it's, it's, it's a prose, but I definitely think, um, yes, as is, is definitely like a, like a format that does not, you know, comply with any format in that sense or form but absolutely that's well taken
Yeah, I, and I, but I, I've been very pleased that you are willing to commit to the story before uh, committing to a format, right? I, I, I think that we, there, there has been a difficulty, particularly in MFA programs, right, where people come in and they know they're going to write a novel, but they don't, you know, I mean, that's kind of all they know, or they have a chunk that they wrote as undergraduates. And so, you know, they're already committed to novel when in fact their material would be better in, in other forms, you know, in part because they just don't read that many novels. Um, you have the advantage of, of being well-read um, as well as well-versed in, in visual, uh, you know, uh, visual media. Um, yeah, so I, but I, I, in a way, because of the subject matter right now, for me, it's this great, like, um, it's this great, ambivalence is not the right word because there's pejorative mm -hmm. uh, uh, connotations to the word ambivalence, but it's a, it's this, it, it's in this in-between place in exactly the way uh, Mustafa is, yeah. Um, so I, 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 I never have the guts not to have a genre, mm -hmm. um, but I think it's, I think it's really cool that you felt able to, to, to do that, right, in a, in an environment that, is generally speaking, that's the first decision everybody makes. Yeah, I feel like I and and honestly, like you know, both of your points are definitely like you know, um, they resonate with me in a sense because I think again, going back to the issue with how editing novels is obviously something that I've I've, I've written a lot of like short stories, obviously, and you know, I'm finally kind of like getting getting around to like understanding what short stories are about. And I feel like venturing into the novel, my question has always been, well, where do you actually like go about editing that novel? Because obviously, you know, keeping track of themes, keeping track of everything, keeping track of scenes. What are scenes are important? Why am I even moving Mustafa here? Why is he even doing this? Why is he going inside the car wash where people are naked and like being slamming inside the car? Like all these kind of like things that I've had in mind, like are always been but am I really writing a scene? Am I moving the story? And I definitely agree that I am at a cross crossroads right now where I feel like I can at least write four or five chapters of a novel like at this moment and and see where they're going in that sense. And even flashbacks, not having to like think about flashback too much. I feel like flashbacks or like, you know, past, the past has been so limited in that sense, but obviously like in a point where it can be braided and done in a way that is not jarring or like info dump or like it's not moving it. But I agree, it follows the novel at some points and it drops it and follows the screenplay at other points and it drops it. But the whole idea was just scenes. Cool. I, I mean, I like that. I, and I like that you can go either way now. Yeah. You can go both ways, yes. both directions, yeah. But it probably is time to decide, yes? Right. I mean. Right. Yeah. 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 I, th I think that's, you know, that crossroads is, is in front of you and, and, but you'll be wise to make a, a formal decision. Yeah. But you've got yourself to the place where you know you can make that formal decision. Yeah. Right? That it's not, it's not being forced on you by inexperience or, you know, sort of lack of courage to try something, you know, you don't know that you're good yeah. at. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Shall we move on? Mm -hmm. Right, so I think um, kind of coming into sci-fi has been something new to me, obviously, and I think Rav could definitely, you know, talk about that, of how much I've been kind of like stuck in that realism aspect of it, which is I like, and I feel like I'm learning how to flesh out, but also the technology aspect has been very interesting. Um, and obviously, like, you know, I'm not William Gibson, and um, I'm kind of like in the crossroads between Borges Ted Chang and William Gibson and like, you know, leaning yeah. more towards, towards Borges. <laughs> what a great crossroads. Yeah, like, does it get better? Like, yeah. So in that sense, kind of like, I'll just kind of like, if this was like a pitch deck and I'm kind of like showing it to like network or something, um, this is kind of like what I think about the different aspects of this world. So the neurochip is basically interface with the brain. Um, they're implanted in users' brains, typically minimal invasive surgical procedure. Um, they're made of advanced sensors and circuits that can detect, interpret neuroscience generated by the brain. Um, they connect with the nervous system, basically, and create seamless communication between the chip and the user's brain. This is kind of like how they work, just kind of like over level. Um, so the chip serves as a very important element here in the story because 
it gives a hub for the digital information where the day-to-day -day memories are stored, where the personal data are stored, uh, preferences, settings, all that kind of stuff for these characters. Um, also, they, what matters about this chip is that they simulate these feelings, the seeing, the hearing, the touch, the taste, and even the smell with the brain to create that kind of like immersive experience while they are inside that digital city. And that uses basically neuroscience and virtual reality technology. Obviously, this is still higher level because I'm thinking about it. Obviously, I'm not a scientist and I think about it exactly giving the exact information that I need to move the story forward in that sense. Um, the other thing is the portals. Basically, it's just a way to connect virtual city to the connect. Uh, <coughs> sorry. It's basically a gateway that connects virtual city of Chicago server to the physical world. Right. So it's like a server. Um, the devices basically communicate wirelessly with a neuro chip and they establish a secure low latency connection um, in that sense to make it, you know, possible for it to be processed like a, a like a, um, it renders like an RFS speed. Um, it uses combinations of high speed broadband connections and advanced networking technologies to ensure reliable and fast connection into the virtual world. Um, so once the connection is established, users are greeted in virtual interface that resembles city map. The map shows the different areas, residential, commercial, districts, and entertainment, and the user can select the areas to teleport, uh, teleport there uh, instantly. That's kind of like the idea of the interface to the server. Now, what is it really made of, right? Like if you think about digital city of Chicago and that kind of like question that comes up, you know, that came up to me a lot when I'm thinking about, well, I'm putting all these people like in this digital city, what is it really made of? So three things, right? Advanced artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and nanotechnology. AI is basically about the seamlessness of the experience, right? It's just vast amount of data um, are being, in a sense, um, churned fast enough for it to create that experience. Virtual reality is just about simulation sentences and being there. Nanotechnology is about the objects, the physical objects within that world. So they can interact with it, they can move, they can have fun, they can like do whatever, drink, party, do all these things, right? Drive that physical object uh, of it is the nanotechnology aspect of this world. Um, here's kind of like an excerpt. Now, I mean, kind of like talking about technology and thinking about how the, now what we care about the steel room therapy, right? What is what is it really about? I'm gonna read this. Um, this is basically um, an excerpt from what I wrote uh, in a way, kind of like braiding it in with like politics. So, but why can't I drive past the three mile radius from the highway, Mustafa asked, because SRT's AI can only construct a three mile radius of organic memory from the incident location that we fed it, Janine explained, fidgeting with her hands. Why not? What's the harm? Mustafa asked. Janine took a sip of water saying, you're from Israel, right? Yes, Mustafa lied, wondering why, where this was going. The incident and the three mile radius are like the US embassy in Jerusalem. Even though the embassy was established in Jerusalem, legally speaking, it's a US territory. And so is the steel room within your subconscious, Janine said, trying to make her point. We must keep those two worlds from colliding. Okay, I see, Mustafa said, nodding. But how will I know if I'm close to the edge of the radius? There is a red blanket of photovoltaic light. Janine said, no matter what happens, don't cross it. What if I did, Mustafa asked. The research isn't comprehensive yet, but I tell all of my patients that the risk of crossing the blanket always outweighs the gain, Janine said, glaring at him, because you don't want to chance the US embassy taking over Jerusalem, let alone Israel, do you? Mm. This is kind of like understanding the, the urgency with, with how the whole kind of like steel room work in that sense, understanding that they're limited within a mile radius of organic memory being produced, how the setting works in that sense. Obviously, this is kind of like to give what would happen if Mustafa is to cross that line or him being told that trope of like a story, like don't go into the, you know, the, the room and like a person will be like, okay, I have to go to the room right now in that sense. Now, I know Islam, this can I yeah. sorry, can I just ask a, a plot question quickly? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm wondering this is this is not sort of directly related, but it's kind of making me think of this. Um the alien and Jimmy stuff and some of that was kind of coming through in the first um the PC workshop for my class, but like Alien and Jimmy, the other couples, you know, like having this sort of like sexual dynamic right. where like Mustafa's almost being pimped out, kind of. 
And I, I was like curious about that and curious about like, cause he's undergoing this therapy, right? But Yair is kind of taking advantage of him. Mm-hmm. Is that kind of what's happening? So, so basically what happened is um, in that sense, Mustafa is being triggered after he has the incident with the razor. That's kind of like okay. the focal point. So the razor becomes the issue. It triggers something and he threatens Eileen. So there's something that, right. the, yeah, the concept called permanent residence. So a permanent resident within the digital city of Chicago means that a resident that has died and is permanently living in a digital city right now. They don't exist outside. And with Mustafa threatening a permanent resident, he can immediately be taken out. And his dispatcher, right. his dispatcher would license would be canceled. So Yair, what you said is right. Yair pushed Mustafa to go through steel room therapy, but also Jimmy owns steel room therapy. And he asked right. Mustafa to allow him to sneak peek, take a sneak peek at his sessions that later on exposes him in that sense. Okay. He had so does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes that makes perfect sense. I was a little bit I was a little bit mixed up there. Yeah. Thank no you. Problem. I have another question coming with that, but like go yeah. on. Go on. So kind of like this this idea of like the US embassy taking over Jerusalem, let alone Israel is the whole idea of the steel room therapy being that whole three mile radius being dangerous enough if you cross that. Um, now, the whole idea of that, the subconscious in that sense, in this story, the subconscious lies outside the three-mile radius, right? And the whole idea of Mustafa should not cross. And this is kind of where the question comes in later in the story. Now, what is it really that whole steel room therapy is about? It's basically an advanced AI psychotherapy. Why? It, it's the whole hope of a more accurate, objective, and unbiased assessment of patient's mental health and then the traditional therapy. That was the hope behind creating it. Um, it's basically an evolved concept of a rage room. It's where, you know, like people go around and like smashing things inside the room. This is where it came from, the concept. Um, but it, it's the whole idea of creating three mile radius simulation within the realm of the subconscious. This is kind of like what the technology is really about. Um, yeah. Is that... Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Okay, so characters. Obviously, I went ahead, played with the AI a lot, and created all these characters. Hopefully, I'm not violating any ethical <laughs> codes here. Um, these are characters that are not real. I mean, hopefully, the AI is not like using real characters and like basing off them. That's that's always the hope. But my my goal is to kind of like understand um, again, like going back to the the formatting of why I've done this. My whole idea is, has always been to make sure that I'm writing characters that are not flat. Make sure that each character gets an arc. Like you know, make sure that all these characters' arcs work together towards like accumulation uh, accumulation more point in, in in the future. So when I think about Mustafa and how I present him, um, I think about his wants. He basically just wants to keep Kasim and never let go. And what he needs is to actually let go. This is kind of like in my mind helped me a lot, just figuring out where am I taking Kasim, Mustafa, what kind of journey Mustafa has to go through in order for him to complete his arc. Huda, on other, um, Ula, on the other hand, is basically his wife. Um, she's um, an elementary school art teacher. What she wants is basically to keep the family together, right? Obviously, she's the person who's really doing the work. And what she really needs also is to let go of the pillow she's been dressing in Kasim's shirt. She's still grieving in her own way, the same way uh, Mustafa is grieving in his own way by sticking to these memories. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Uh, now, Kasim the deceased, basically, uh, he was killed at 17 uh, during the administration, I guess, building a new uh, Israeli settlement to the north end of his hometown. What he wanted initially was basically to fly to Europe and play soccer professionally. That's kind of like, you know, what he wanted before. Now, there is a digital version of Kasim that's been replicated based on his memory that talks about um, that is wholly built up based on his memories. And therefore, um, Kasim's, the, the deceased Kasim's wants and needs become the digital version's wants and needs in that sense. And that's kind of like the... The, at the bottom of the whole issue of him sitting and watching that TV show with his son and being uh, and rewatching these games over and over again. That's kind of like, you know, the, the crux of why the digital version is stuck in time because he's dead and there are no new memories of the digital version. 
If I can jump in, um, Ismail, I just want to compliment you on how like you use this story to sort of explicate Israeli settler colonialism and the way that like Palestinians are sort of oppressed by this like Zionist sort of supremacy and the way Mustafa is kind of like colonized by this, the way, you know, his son's memories are taken from him because he was like protesting uh, against this Israeli settlement. And now he's working with Yair, Yair and like Yair, like he had to pose as Roni, you know what I mean? He's been colonized effectively again and again and again, right? And it is about, and I don't claim to know about this experience. Um, I don't want to like speak speak for like Palestinian folks, but like it does seem to me like this holding on, like holding on to memories and like wanting to preserve what is, what belongs to oneself, you know what I mean? And what is being sort of like violently like taken over. Um, and reclaimed. I think that's what works so well for me about steel room therapy is the grander metaphor for what's the Israeli-Palestinian conflict um, and the settler colonialism there. It works beautifully. It's so well done. And I really think that like, um, I, I don't know the TV industry like PK does, but I think that sort of like emphasizing that part of the pitch Mm -hmm. you know and being like this is a palestinian story right like this is a time when people like really want to hear diverse voices um and this is something that's like not on tv right now and it's like not really in um literature in the states right now so that i mean i just wanted to say that really quickly talk about costume reminded me of that it's it's very masterfully done thank you yeah thanks a lot i appreciate it uh, yeah. This is kind of like the basically the, the idea in mind. I don't. I feel like I've had this conversation before with PK about um, the different um, kind of like TV shows that've been out there and kind of our representation, you know. And um, PK told me about Rami and like you know we talked. I think it, we talked about Mo and Rami and like different shows, but we still feel like you know this is kind of like the time and this is kind of like why I'm thinking about it right now more and what why I'm standing at that crossroad is because I feel like this is that time where it feels like, you know, the right time for us to be telling these stories. Yes. Uh, keeping that in mind, keeping in mind being inclusive, though, keeping in mind that we're not, we're not creating narrative that uh, polarized, we're creating narrative that actually brings in and tugs at people's heart by, by not creating a conflict and taking sides, but actually showing realities where both of them are. And that's whole idea of like, yeah, you're actually having a brother who was killed too. It's a whole idea of like, okay, we're humanizing them. We're not, they're not evil. We're not evil. It's just a situation. What's happening right now? Let's work through it. That's kind of like what, what made me in a sense gravitate towards that. Yeah, absolutely. That's, I was just going to bring up Yair's yeah, dead brother. I think that like the fact that like, you know, I have my own feelings like, you know, as I have anti-Zionist feelings like as a Jewish person, but like obviously, right, like, I think that it's so important to be in inclusive, like what you're saying, to not take sides, to sort of demonstrate that there, there is this violence going on, there is this horrifying stuff going on, but humans are involved. It's all Thank about you. humans at yeah. every point. And, and you do such a beautiful job of demonstrating Thank that. Thank you. Yeah, it's just the whole idea of like not to polarize the narrative. Right. Make, I mean, obviously I'm in, this, this work is inherently biased. I'm Palestinian, like that's not gonna change. Right. The, the idea of the majority of the fiction that comes out of, because I've, I've been reading a lot of Israeli fiction and I've been reading a lot of Palestinian fiction over the past year. And the truth is um, we do not exist. Like we, there, there are no intersectionalities between there. We do not exist. It's, it's, it's always us and them in that sense. And, and how we're being portrayed and how they're being portrayed in our fiction has always been the idea of like, Th that them you know like they exist out there behind the wall and like our understanding of them and that kind of like to me was like what if we bring those two in that conversation and like see how they work with having a dynamic of like being affected by the conflict in similarly in a way beautiful that's wonderful thank you ismail there's also the opportunity um and i was going to mention this earlier but i didn't want to interrupt the the flow of what was happening that what you have you're envisioning of it being seven episodes of one season could actually be three to five seasons of material that you actually have mm -hmm. because when it's actually taken into screenplay format you're going to see it's 
much longer than what you think it, it actually is right now, where an entire flashback, right? Or an entire memory of what happened in the past could be an entire episode, right? And so what Raph has also just brought up is your opportunity to do a Rashomon type effect. Mm -hmm. So you could show multiple perspectives in this where we also jump into the others. Uh, I think it was Ariana and Julian. Was that the character's names? Uh, um, Jimmy and uh, Jimmy and uh, uh, yeah, we jump into their character or or whatever you want to show. Um, and that's an episode, right? And then it becomes sort of a shifting, uh, and this is just possibilities of play, right? Where you mentioned Orwell, right? So we're shifting maybe between the Orwellian 1984 and an Orwellian down and out in Paris and London, yeah. where we, it suddenly becomes memoir and then it suddenly comes back to the reality. So maybe there are three worlds we're shifting in. There's the therapy world, with Janine, then there's the, there's a, well, you, you get what I'm saying. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, that, that definitely makes a lot of sense. And I, I definitely agree with you. The material are definitely going to tra translate differently when it comes to episodes based on like length and like, you know, materials and like, what am I doing with, with the actuals? Because I, I looked at my pilot, it's roughly 20,000 words right now. That's kind of like how I think about it each, each episode, I think. And this is definitely going to be more than uh, an hour long kind of like i'm looking at scenes kind of like thinking about scenes and how the scenes are going to unfold and i'm definitely thinking this is going to be more than an hour so you're absolutely right in thinking about yeah, you you could even do an entire episode just on cassine you know it's just exploring cassine yeah uh in this wider universe that you've created and then integrate you know yeah. it's no, more absolutely. focused on him absolutely yeah thank you this is basically rami also like thinking about, you know, all the, the the arcs that I'm working with, playing video games, not doing well. If you notice that, you know, throughout all of these characters, there's one theme that comes with their arcs that tags all these arcs together is the loss of Qasim. This is, I love how like the, the pillow gets, you know, like, you know, like, <laughs> I was talking to Bryce about it, and it's like, the pillow gets, you know, its own character. And, you know, the whole idea of like, this is kind of like the character that looms and sits on the dinner table every night. Yeah. And this is the character that defines their arcs and brings their arcs together. Because obviously we can say Ali, for example, he's like, you know, he doesn't have any friends at school now and he's like dejected, but he, and he's trying, trying to make friends with Ramis, but then he keeps kicking him out and they keep getting into these fights where he actually needs to make new friends. And Ramis also like, he's not, he's stuck with these video games and he's not doing his homeworks and stuff. But what we understand is that all of their arcs revolve around losing Qasim. Yeah. directly or indirectly and that to me makes me feel like i can take all of their stories as a family each of their arc and braid them together in that sense to create a narrative that shows all of this family together coming to a point of healing of moving on in terms of that genre rites of passage that's kind of like my whole idea of bringing them together yeah and if I may, this isn't the first time you've had a sort of family story about the death of a child, you know? Right. Um, and I think that this is really like your piece de resistance, like this is you take it, taking that and making it huge and making it beautiful, even more beautiful than it was before. Um, but yeah, bringing the family coming together in their grief yeah. is just like, it's, it's really powerful. It's really heartrending. Yeah. And understanding like kind of like how all of them do it differently. Like when we think about Mustafa is doing it in a way where he's like sinking into these memories. Ola is basically dressing this pillow with uh, with his shirt and like taking it to their art studio and like drawing all these. And then uh, Rami is basically evading everything, being stuck with these video games. And Ali is basically searching for friends or being rejected alone. All of these things kind of like together loom in and tell us like how grief is such a grief being stuck in grief is such an interesting and, and a personal experience where every single person does it differently and that's why it, it's painting it's like kind of like a metaphor for painting what grief how how we deal with grief differently because obviously every single member of the family is dealing with grief differently 
and, yeah. and, and that's kind of like what grips at my heart when it comes to the arcs and how to tie these arcs together. Absolutely. Right. So this is kind of like I shoved the bully in real life, basically the whole the whole traumatized traumatizing events. And this we we kind of like visit it like in later episodes, how you know, like a plot twist kind of like Ashraf being part of that, those, you know, drivers too, which is gonna be interesting. But this is kind of like our way of thinking about the Palestinian characters. Obviously, there are a reason why I separated them, just because I think about settings at the beginning when we talked about how the um the settings are kind of like across Palestine, Israel, uh, the US and um, the digital set of Chicago. So characters were also like separated in that sense. When we think about the Israeli characters, uh, obviously Air comes, the first thing that comes to mind, um, you know, business owner, um, obviously he's also struggling with losing his brother. And it's basically his, because uh, I've seen so many people in that sense, like Air's personality where they get stuck in work. It's just work. It becomes because in, in a sense, Yair is looking at it from a like a point of view, view, view of hard boiled business kind of like perspective to that and dealing with his emotions by working harder, growing this business, having all this is being on, on top, being in control. And we see it cracking down, obviously, in the story when he opposes, you know, bringing UC back to life and Mustafa catches him inside UC's room. This is kind of like a moment for me where I was like, okay, there are two doors right now. He's standing in the hallway, one door that looks in, in, in that portal, one door that looks at Yusuf's room and one door looks at Qasim's door and all of them coming together in that sense. So the story in a sense to me, that's the point where the story felt like it came together where Yusuf's door uh, and um, Qasim's door are right across from each other. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right, so Ari is uh, is a character. Um, he's kind of like one of my favorite characters. I've always wanted to be like him, <laughs> you know. Unfortunately, you know, it's just too hard. Um, it's the whole idea of um, needing someone to do the heavy lifting, right? Because obviously, Mustafa needs a character that is a go getter, technology whiz that goes out there and gets the work done. Uh, physics and computer engineering, Technion, um, and he has like a PhD in philosophy from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Um, his favorite quote, which is honestly my favorite quote ever, uh, it turns out that an eerie type of chaos can lurk just behind facades of order. And yet deep inside the chaos lurks an even eerier type of order. Douglas Habitat. It's, it's just to me, this kind of um, quote resembles the whole system in a way, the whole chaos and order, how there is order to chaos and there's chaos to order. The whole interchangeability between that, to me, represents what the story is about, honestly. Um, obviously, he needs to be challenged and he gets the opportunity. He's just doing a mundane job, getting hooking people in, uh, teleporting them into the general city of Chicago, making sure everything is okay. But now he just gets this one in life kind of stuff. And he steps up. If you see, like in episode three, um, he actually asks for money and like starts doing things. Like He goes from being this smart person who's underutilized in a place to being that was that actually creates codes and decodes subconsciouses and writes um that writes a code that translates colloquial Hebrew to colloquial Arabic and which he does what he does is like really impressive. He's one of my Matt favorite. Gordon. What's that? He's Matt Gordon. Yes, he's our Matt Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um Ronnie is obviously but if you see how kind of like all these things work. Rani is basically the person that uh, Mustafa has been using his character to get inside. He's been chipped instead, instead of him. And he's paying a cut of what he makes every month to Rani. Um, Rani is struggling, right? Struggling with drug addiction. He's been rehabbed three times. And um, and if we think about UC as well, UC is a person, who, the kid who, they call him roof snakes, basically. So um, military... Uh, is military um, is mandatory uh, serving the military is mandatory in Israel basically and there are a lot of um, both um, Arabs and Israelis have been standing up against that and they call them uh, refuse nicks. Uh It's basically a derogatory term that you know um, that you know touches these people and they end up actually being jailed because of it. So you see, is actually a peaceful figure and that's the irony where the peaceful figure comes in and wants to make peace with the West Bank, he ends up dead. And that's what I love about it because life is full of irony where good people try to win good things, they get smashed. 
So that's kind of like um, one thing looking at it. But if you look at it too, with these characters, every single character's arc, even Ari in a, at some point, has been about the death of Yusi from the Israeli character. Because all of them come together. Because so if you think about Yair, his obsession with business, his being there all the time, growing up, growing his net worth and all that stuff is just a distraction from what happened. Um, Ronnie, like the drug addiction and being in rehab and all that stuff, losing his family and kids because of that too. So kind of like bringing those, making those arcs revolve around the loss of these. Yusi and Kasim has been the focal point that I feel like it brings these arcs together and ties them up. Any questions? Hmm. Yeah. Right. So these are obviously, this is Buzzka. It's scary. <laughs> now, I, I just had a quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Was there a choice to make them young men instead of one young man and one young woman? Or why two young men? And did you have a thought about that? Yeah. So obviously, it's his biases. Um, I, I feel like, you know, growing up in the world, like kind of like being in that sense. Because I think about Eileen in terms of like making her the figure that speaks for the new race. That's kind of like, you know, the other side of it. But my my kind of like experience with growing up back home and like seeing these workplaces and these like uh, settlements have being 99% predominantly men. So a majority of these Palestinian workers that work in these Israeli settlements like Mustafa are predominantly men. Uh, like I'd say like 99% of them are men. Uh, but obviously this is my biases bringing into the story, which can definitely be fixed. So obviously this is a scary looking kid, but <laughs> this is kind of like my AI way of looking at like Buzzcut is basically, so Buzzcut is an actual character that was created by the AI. So this is kind of like what I mean by giving a form, what, what the AI, the steel room therapy does, it gives form to emotion. And that's kind of like the product that Mustafa has to deal with inside the steel room therapy. So it's basically the scars that the bully lives inside Mustafa's, the, the AI gives it a form, and this is the form that Mustafa has to fight or come in terms with in order for him to like um, move on with his past, which we see like, you know, it gets very complicated very soon. I can really see the Gibson here. Yeah. <laughs> Especially. Yeah. Uh, so basically, the, the the idea of these characters, this, this AI, this, the steel room therapy giving form to these characters, it also gives them wants and needs. Um, it, it brings them from out, it drags them from the subconscious from outside the blanket and they walk right into the blanket. It's like a, it's like a scary kind of like blah, blah, blah movies like we see them walking inside the blanket uh, from the subconscious because it gives them form. That's what the steel room photovoltaic kind of like bubble is about. So this person shows up and they're multiplying. Every time he kills them, they're multiplying. And he's like, shit, like, what do I need to do? Um, so that's kind of like the whole idea. Thunderstorms. Um, yeah, so basically the wants and the needs, the wants are gonna be inflicting as much pain as possible about uh, Mustafa and they're relentless. They will go far and beyond to like sabotage his life, sabotage his kids' memories. They will go inside his uh, memory timeline and defile memories. They're ready to grab his kids, ready to grab characters, burn them down, shoot them. This is it. This is the moment where you're actually, instead of taking pills and talking about your feelings, you're actually seeing them in front of you and you're like, shit, what can I do? This is kind of like the moment for me where I was like, yes, this is the technology that needs to happen. Um, so the American characters are interesting. Um, obviously, a lot of biases with AI too. I feel like we've talked about this a lot and Lindsay and uh, DJNA and others from my class were talking about like drawing of the AI and what the AI brings out. Obviously, it's also my biases of how the people look. Um, this is kind of like, obviously this is just like illustrator, so they should not be taking, you know, to their face value, but obviously we take them because we see them. Um, but thinking about Jimmy, Jimmy's role is very interesting. Um, Jimmy, he's the owner of that steel room therapy. He owns 6% of Digital City of Chicago. Um, his journey is, is one of my favorite journeys in this story. It's basically going from a mega rich game developer to a figurative god inside the city. He's just rolling over. Um, and yeah, it's just the whole idea of him 
buying up the city, the whole kind of arc for him is buying up the city and making sure instead of making it a private country club, he's opening it up to the masses and he's using Mustafa's journey to open up the whole thing to the masses. So this is kind of like the whole idea of his arc also, coming up with business, coming up with his wife. And this ties back to his wife, Eileen. She's dead. Because obviously we need a reason why Jimmy is putting his entire existence and life and money. It's usually love or hate, you know, but love is definitely stronger than hate. So like thinking about Eileen, he just loves her in that sense she died and he recreated her inside that city. And this whole idea of Eileen character revolves around a new breed. And when I think about Eileen, I think about um, inter intersectionalities of like different genders, intersectionalities of different things that, you know, it's kind of like a comment for me, a metaphor to comment on these things that are are in our place, right? Like we think about all these um, breeds, we call them, right? And, and I don't know if that new breed is actually like a, a, a proper term to use, but this whole idea of there's a digital copy um, and Aileen gets denied love by her daughter who doesn't want to visit her inside the city. And she's determined to reshape herself and create a new breed inside the city of, of permanent residents that feel like they belong. So that's kind of like the arcs that, you know, I'm working with with Aileen and Jimmy. Cool. Does that make sense? Sorry, I've been talking forever. Good. So let's just look at cool stuff. This is basically my attempts of like making stuff look pretty and you know showing off my ai <laughs> i mean obviously this is not you know any way close to any of that stuff but i'm i've tried to do photoshop and put like a, a blanket on this didn't really work i suck but uh, this is kind of like what i think about digital city think we about just talk about how to do that oh yes i definitely yeah really, yeah, yeah no anyway i'll i'll shut <laughs> up but no i definitely way, want just to tell you i know you feel like you're talking forever but this is yeah. really good yeah so kind of like thinking about when I when I think about pitching this to like uh, people who think about what would show up on the screen, I think about what Mustafa does best, which is his escort activities, right? So like, so what he does is basically he, the first scene we see him like jumping off a transparent bridge and being eaten by sharks, right? And it's just the whole idea of like, how do you create, because obviously like, you know, if you look at Gibson and I feel like I've had this conversation with, with Pinkney a lot, Gibson thinks about uh, like the, the virtue of using virtual stuff. But the truth is like, as humans, we think about, we think about the, the, the worst parts of using that before we think about the virtues, like the virtues, like, a, like a, an afterthought in a way. So like we think about the sex, we think about the drugs, we think about all these things that, you know, we feel like would bring us that instant gratification before we think about building a civilization, being nice to people, right? So this is kind of like what I think about. Escorts and rescue activities, this would be amazing on the screen. Watching a, cr a group of um, upper middle class women, um, basically that's kind of like the whole idea of the flashback, grilling Mustafa on their bonfire uh, when they're out hiking. That's kind of like one scene in mind. Another one is like basically him jumping off that bridge and being eaten by sharks. Uh, another one was, um, basically him at that rooftop party, the orgies, the drugs, yeah. all that stuff. Kind of like creating an environment where a, like a producer, TV producer could see all these amazing, like eye-catching activities in that world that are interesting. I really, really wanted to create that car wash. Um, just, it was disturbing and I couldn't really do it. All these people hanging from like, you know, naked hanging from like that stuff. It was just disturbing. But to me, that car wash scene really sets up the theme for the story really sets up the catalyst for the story. Like there's, there's like, you know, magnitude to this. All right, so. Um, Ismail, were you thinking of Neuromancer at all with the drugs? No. You weren't thinking of Neuromancer? Which was the Gibson you were thinking of? I was thinking about uh, the peripheral, to be honest. The peripheral, okay. No, I yeah. don't really. Um, you would, I, I think you'd love Neuromancer. It's um, when it talks a lot about the instant gratification instant gratification and like you know hyper sophisticated technologies and it's yeah. just riddled with drugs it's wild yeah. no it, i mean honestly it makes sense it makes a lot of sense and i feel like that's kind of right. like where i sometimes i get taken away taken out of like gibson's world in that sense because like it just seems too too great <laughs> right <laughs> too perfect yeah. and too great like you know we create we, we exist in a world where like you know we we kind of like 
search for pleasure before we search for wisdom and we learn kind of like from our mistakes in that sense but you know obviously it works now kind of like talking about the last part of this presentation uh palestinian israeli settings obviously this is a, a very touchy topic a very heartfelt topic and my job is to make sure that i'm not focusing too much on the conflict itself but on what are the results of the conflict? What are the day-to-day -day kind of like life within that situation that can be highlighted? Um, for the folks who don't know, kind of like, you know, Palestine and Israel, if you look at it, this is the Gaza Strip. This is a small thing. This is the Gaza Strip, right? It's a very tiny place. It has millions of people. Um, the West Bank is here, right? Do you see that line? And basically outside of it is Israel. Um, the Gaza Strip is basically... Uh, ruled by Hamas uh, right now. Uh, it used to be by um, the, I mean, Israel, and it used to be by the PLO, but now Hamas is the, uh, the leader. Uh, West Bank is basically by the PLO. But kind of like when you think about Palestine and Israel, you need to think about land. Obviously, this is where land becomes an issue. And um, if you look at this signpost, this is kind of like what we see every time we're driving around the West Bank. So, this road leads to area A under the Palestinian Authority. The entrance for Israeli citizens is forbidden, dangerous to your lives, and is against the Israeli law. This is such an interesting kind of like pan banner that tells us, so there are different areas, A, B, and C. So B is Israel, A is a Palestinian, and C is within the West Bank um, that has been, according to uh, the Oslo Accords, it's been like uh, debated to be a joint run area. However, um, if you think about it, 60% of within the West Bank, 60% of the areas uh, seas are controlled. 60, it's actually 60% of the West Bank areas, area C, which means that Israel also controls 61% of the West Bank. Does that make sense? So if you hear in the news about Israeli settlements and why the whole world are like, you know, going crazy with Israeli settlements and why are they wrong? And some of some of the saying of legal, some of them are saying legal. Well, under Oslo Accords, Area C, which is 60% of the West Bank, are basically to be jointly controlled by both Israel and Palestine. However, as of moment right now, Israel controls all Area C. So if Palestinians were to build homes on these Area Cs, they will be demolished. And that's why a lot of the areas right now in the West Bank, you have all these settlements. So kind of like to give you like a visual representation of our setting right now. This is Selfit, this is Ariel, and this is Barkan, right? This is within the West Bank. Now, Selfit is a Palestinian city. Ariel is an Israeli settlement. Barkan is an Israeli settlement. Sarat is a Palestinian. Harris is a Palestinian. So like, do you see kind of like how they're braided together? Kind of like the whole idea of understanding why this conflict matters, because we actually in the West Bank are living with the Israeli settlers in that sense. Those right. there are Palestinian cities and Israeli settlers. So that kind of explains Mustafa's journey every day going around. So Yair lives in Ariel settlement, Mustafa lives in Selfit, and they all meet at Barkan in the industrial park, that commercial zone. Does that make sense? Yeah. Perfect. Uh, there are different stats about, you know, selfie and like you know Barkan and like all that stuff when they were established how much population but that's all kind of like stuff that you know you can definitely learn about but that's it this is basically what I have in mind when it comes to this thank you that was great Ismail thank you I love that so thank you yep very coherent um and uh yeah so all right well so so what you know what questions that you know that uh what i you know i you all have too but i you know i've spoken to to ismail more than enough i i feel like we've we've talked to each other enough for a lifetime ismail so i will leave it to uh i will leave uh, time open for other questions. I mean, of course, I, I could talk us all to death, but uh, but so so I but I will open it to my uh, my colleagues on the panel to see what what they want to bring up. Well, Ismail, I I never want to stop talking to you. I you're a font of knowledge. I so appreciate the wisdom you bring uh, to class, 
the craft wisdom you bring to class. It's just been amazing watching you grow over these past three years. It's just been so exciting to watch you kind of take that jump from literary realism to more speculative fiction. It's been so wonderful. Um, I love, 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 I think I already said this, but I love what you said about humanizing both sides of the conflict. I tend to get like, oh man, you know what I mean? Like, oh, what's going on here? Um, but I think you're right. I think it's key, especially if you have, if you if you want to have a show about this, right? Having Yossi, sorry, how do you pronounce Yossi? Yossi? Uh, you see, yeah. You see? Yeah, having, having you see, like, also be this, like, um, kind of figure of grief, you know, along with Qasim and having like the Israeli characters also grieving someone and having Mustafa understand their grief, right? Having them connect through that grief, I think is just, it's just so narratively powerful. And when you have that kind of, that humanization of all these characters coupled with these rich, you know, Gibsonian, you know, Aldous Huxley kind of like, you've got the cyberpunk, but you've also got the sort of like old school futurism going on too. Um, I thought of Soma immediately when you were, when I was reading, you were talking about drugs. Um, it's, it, it's, it comes together in such a lovely package. I'm excited, frankly, I'm just really excited to see it in screenplay format and novel format. Cause I think I want to like dig in. I want to, you know, I want to, I want to sit down. I want to tuck in with, with, with your book and really just like luxuriate in it. Cause it's just, uh, it's just so cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ismail. Um, I really love the uh, reading this piece and like Raph um, was excited um, by the content. Uh, I, I also want to see it in its novelized form. And it might be, of course, the choice is yours, which to, to launch into first, but um, it, it might be better to go novelized first because your, your vision is so expansive and it might be easier to see it novelized and then maybe even see about publication first and then start preparing the screenplay afterwards because the the piece is so strong and it's so topical and it's so relevant that uh, you have the opportunity even maybe to sell it from a short story or sell it uh, from a novel into a series and it, with real potential, seriously real potential because it reminds me of Eternal Sunshine, Everything Everywhere All at Once, which um, just won the Oscar, Altered Carbon, which was also a hit. And these are things that you sort of want to have in your pitch, what, what, what shows that are comparable to it. The questions that I had upon reading it really had to do with the, the timing of, of when this is happening in the universe. So like, is there a TikTok or Twitter in this world? Like, would we call it TikTok or Twitter? Is, are we a little bit more advanced for this technology or are we right at this time? And it was just invented. And, and then um, along with that, is there still football in this world? Um, and it, are there, you know, is there a Messi? Um, and would it be players we have not heard of yet? And, and the other question, because you mentioned uh, Gibson and our, all, also Orwell, it made me also think about Anthony Burgess's Clockwork Orange and all of these writers sort of created their own language. And you did a, you did a bit of that already, but is it possible that maybe uh, language and dialogue will shift in this alternate universe or um, that people speak a little bit differently yeah and um are there new problems politically and what are they not only from what has happened um in the past but is there is there a new future yeah on the horizon absolutely i i think your questions are, are super valid uh Piroz. and i feel like this is kind of like when we had a conversation about how to open up this world and like see if you can serialize it in a way where you can take different point of views and see and run with it and I feel like that is a point like the question that I'm, I'm just going to be honest like the question that kept 
I, I kept asking myself, I was like, what about the government taking over? Okay, there are police there. You know, how do the police work? And what are the government, what if the government takes over this place? Like, can they just exist in like a, a digital city without like, you know, let's say the United States of America government controlling or something like all these kind of like questions that I had in mind that definitely makes me think about opening up the space um, to like actually have a, a like an ecosystem that encompasses all these things and ask all the questions. I think my point is right now is figuring out what can I get away with to tell most of the story and what kind of like re remnant like remaining parts of that world that are interesting enough to pick up other characters that can be used to make other kind of like you know plot lines and storylines. That's kind of like what I'm. It's exactly what I'm thinking about. You know, something you might also think of, Ismail, is um, now that we're kind of going into the political, uh, and the political aspect is so salient throughout this entire uh, conversation. Um, but I'm wondering, I'm thinking of the, the, was it the neutral zone or the neutral room? Right, yes. Neutral where, zone. Neutral, um, zone. neutral zone, yeah. Mm -hmm. The neutral zone, okay. Um, yeah, the neutral zone and like a that like each each person oh god everyone's free i'm freezing aren't i the storm Did killed our out? uh internet oh, out here so i'm here okay <laughs> yeah i uh man it's the storm um yeah. but i'm thinking of like ways that the actual um the sort of functionality of the neurochips, right? The steel room itself can mirror what's happening in Israel and Palestine, right? right? So like there, there are these politically neutral zones, right? There's these zones of conflict. And then you have the Jimmy and Eileen, the American influence, right? Um, as well as the digital city of Chicago. And they have their own kind of imperialist agenda, right? right. And so I was thinking like, how does the geography, how does the political geography map on to what's happening in Mustafa's head. And right. I think, oh man, when you firm that up and you can have that metaphor firing on point, this thing is just gonna take off. It's, yeah. it's just gonna like really be lovely. Even more so. I, I agree with Raf. And, you know, one thing to sort of keep in mind is Jun Bong Ho's The Host. Um, mm -hmm as a framework for you, because when he made that film and in all of the films that he makes, they're all very political. Right. And if you remember the, the opening of that film is actually the American doctor that is uh, pouring the poison into the Han River of uh, South Korea. And that's actually what cre creates the creature that then invades and so he's, you know, talking about the ecological and environmental threat, but also about American uh, imperialism in, in South Korea itself. And so uh, when you do something like that, and then it, it goes into sort of an action family genre type film, it gets very, very exciting. And I think you have that with this. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Yeah, I I will say, and this is a this is maybe a departure from from uh, uh, my colleagues, um, although not not so far because th these things don't have to be exclusive, right? Um, you know, you have to do one first. You can't do them all at the same time. That said, um, you know my whole understanding of science fiction is changing very rapidly because I'm involved with AI, right? And with the way AI is affecting other uh, aspects of, of contemporary storytelling, right? And there is, I don't know what it's going to be exactly, um, no one does and there's no way to know but there is going to be there are going to be i think it will be multiple there are going to be many new ways to tell very complicated uh stories like six months from now yeah you yeah. know um and so I, I this is such an interesting story to me in that you know it, it revisits territory from you know from gibson 
uh, you know, you know, from all the writers you cited and the writers we've talked about. But I don't think it has to exist in a, I mean, it, it can, and it won't hurt it to have that as its basis. But I don't think its final form is going to be in a, you know, and forgive me for the pejorative nature of this, but in a legacy um, medium. Yeah. I think there is a new medium that coming about that will be meant to encompass a story like this and that the the form itself, right, the telling this story in a framework of, you know, augmented reality and, you know, AI driven characters and stuff like that, like this story in that context, which a year ago, I'd have said, no way, like, that's just silly. You know, there's not, that's just science fiction stuff. It's not going to happen. It's definitely happening. Like I, yeah. I, I see it every morning when I wake up and check my news feeds. Um, so, I, you know, I'd say keep developing it, yeah. go, you know, go, you know, into a, into a legacy direction if you want to, in order to kind of give you a bedrock to work from. But, but my difficulty with that is that at that point, you're going to be doing an adaptation of a legacy a piece of legacy material into whatever this new thing is and it seems to me particularly given the subject matter it would there are going to be plenty of people who are adapting their work to to again to this new um experiential ai driven uh immersive uh medium whatever we choose to call it but I would be excited to see you be among the first folks who didn't adapt work, right? But who actually, because you understand this world of storytelling even better, I mean, even better, like I'm some expert, but certainly better than I do, right? Um, and I think I was blocking my mic, sorry about that. But we, we you know, but, but it is, um, it's only intuition, right, for me, and it is, you know, and there are there are much more certain ways to go. Um, but one of the things I, I like about you as a writer, and obviously you understand that when I disparage you and say I don't want to talk to you anymore, I'm kidding. Um, but that that um, um, one of the things you have is what um, Keats called negative capability. Right. And negative capability is I, I'm confident we've talked about this, although, you know, uh, uh, but it's Keats. Why would anybody remember? Right. He's been dead a long time. Um, but negative capability was to Keats the the ability to move forward decisively without um, decisive information and details. Right. And, um, you know, he believed it was the it was the greatest characteristic an artist could possess was the ability to move forward on very little information and no certainty. Um, and I, you have shown that more than almost any other young writer I've ever worked with in that you are willing to work without committing to a specific form. And I have to think that that, that this is this protean piece of work you're doing, right? That can become anything my guess is that its final form hasn't yet been fully invented and that you can be part of inventing it. And, you know, I will certainly offer my assistance and, you know, the lab and, and Matt Gordon is just a frozen picture here, but I will volunteer Matt Gordon for the rest of his natural life. <laughs> um, right. Like, like, like this is, I think this is what we're meant to do. Um, and I think, you know, given that the commentary on politics and on life and on, you know, new inventions of new technologies is the heart of what you're doing. I mean, the weirdest thing for me about Gibson is reading Gibson on paper. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and and, you know, because I'm, I'm like, wow, this, you know, I, I you know. Um, and so so I I. I would encourage you to keep moving forward, but I, you know, I mean, you know, you want to make money at this and I understand that and having it find a, you know, having it find a conventional form that you're not going to have to invent and that you can present to other people in an easy and understandable way 
makes a lot of sense. And I understand it and I have no objections to it. That said, I think this could be a very great experiment um, in representing an immersive digital narrative in an immersive digital narrative form. Yeah. Um, and you seem to me to have the breadth of imagination to encompass that and to resist the urge, which is a very understandable one. Um, you know, I'm frequently frustrated that my work doesn't have a venue yet, right? Like everything I'm doing, like I'm having to invent the the publishing platform for what I'm doing now after a lifetime of absolutely yeah. conventional publishing, right? Um, you know, conventional film, conventional books, you know, conventional magazines. Um, but now I just realized there's no place yet to express what I want to do. And I think this work, one of the things that has fascinated me about this work is that it seems to me to fall into that category. Now, maybe, you know, you've talked about bias, I think, quite elegantly. And so maybe I'm just trying to subsume you into my world of yet unfulfilled ambitions. Um, but I but but. Um, but this just feels to me, and if you don't do it with this, the next one you do, right? Because you've built a whole world here. There are, there's no end to the permutations of this world. And just in the way Gibson's fictions all take place in what feels like a, a fairly unified universe, mm -hmm. right? I mean, as much as one can when he's built it over, you know, 40 some years, um, that, you know, you can always build out to this. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I, I find it, I find it thrilling in a way that like, I find the possibilities thrilling in a way that is beyond even the thrill I feel when I see that a student of mine has written a novel that can succeed or created a podcast that su can succeed. I think this can succeed, but it can also Right. The, the most interesting person for me, perhaps, is um, um, oh, God damn it. Janine. Uh, right, Janine? No, not Janine. Um, the wife who's the new species. Oh, Eileen. Eileen. Thank you, Eileen. Yeah. Eileen yeah. and Janine are too similar to me, by the way. I would change one of them. Um, maybe to Pinkney. I think that's a good character. Name. <laughs> um, but but uh, uh, but 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 that's like I feel like that like I feel like yeah. oh well this is actually a new species of story and that's yeah. why you didn't settle into a conventional legacy form is because my sense is you also feel that right and you were you were one of the first of my writers to really collaborate with AI and um you know and it, it it's it is getting better exponentially um right and so so there really is a partnership there to be had with technology that didn't even exist six months ago yeah and I, I definitely agree with the whole idea of uh the platform i have definitely been like sketching storyboards and like figuring out um because obviously like you know i think the problem with I feel like I I think I I've had this conversation with PK PK uh, the most about like you know us being you know like people of color in America trying to tell their stories and I think Raph as well and you Pinkney but mostly PK I think and and I think it comes down to the whole idea of what... yeah well I've literally the least color of any person <laughs> on the planet I think I, 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 I think it, it comes down to like creating. Um, I mean, we we call it in finance, it's basically like a proof of concept, like, you know, you created like a minimal viable product. And then, you know, if you have an app or something, you at least get a thousand downloads. This is kind of how I think about it. And right, this is right. the whole idea of like, what could be, and I think you, what you touched upon is like amazing because it, it thinks about micro production and what kind of like ways to get part of the story out there done um it could be like a visual visual representation illustration or it could be like visual narration of different scenes that could be 
really eye-catching, interesting for someone to be like, oh, you know what? I actually really like this storyboard. They have like these five minutes kind of like episodes every every couple of a couple of weeks they come out and like I watch them. And that kind of like to me is like micro produce, chop them up these scenes and like try to produce them in a way, create some kind of like um some buzz about them, have like a couple thousand followers about it, and then like reach out to someone and say, listen, this is what I'm doing. What can we do with it? And I feel like I feel like I resonate exactly what you're saying because it starts with the whole idea of like, I really want to like create a proof of concept and take this world and see like what I can do with it. But I do want to finish it first. And I feel like- yeah, No, 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 ab absolutely. I mean, do what you got to do. Yeah. But I'm just thinking like, you, there is the root and, and PK said this and I absolutely understand it and agree with it. And I see the path, right? where you write a really sterling short story version that hints at this world and you have, you know, a chunk of a novel and a full synopsis of the novel and a pitch and you publish the story in the New Yorker and, you know, somebody sweeps up the novel and then the Netflix people come and say, we're going to make a TV show. And that path is a very real path. And I think it is, I would absolutely be proud of you. I would claim complete credit for everything you've done um, and say that you had never even heard of Netflix until you met me. Um, but, right. But, but, but there is this other path, which is very strange and um, which doesn't even exist yet that very few people are going to have the negative capability to tread. Right. And it's it is. Um, uh, and maybe, you know, maybe it's just I don't want to be alone in failing at what I'm doing. Um, but I but I, you know, this feels like that to me. This feels like it could be the first of its kind. Now, it can have the New York, the New Yorker story version of itself. It can have the novel, the Netflix series, all that. But the, the problem is the minute that happens. What, what you do with it that's new becomes adaptation rather than original creation. Um, and there is there's a great deal of loss involved in adaptation and translation, um, right? So I, I, you know, I, all I can say is I am offering you nothing. I am offering you wandering in the desert for 40 years, uh, okay. right? And, and uh, uh, you know, whereas I, I think they're much saner and more established routes to take. But you are one of the very few writers I've encountered who seems to me to have the maturity um, and to have a real grasp of what this new thing looks like. Thanks or so might much. look like. Thank you. Well, so are we? Uh, are we ready to to uh, send Ismail uh, away and, uh, uh, and, and we can discuss his, his future and his fate, fellow panelists? Are we, <laughs> are we ready to have our deliberations? It's going to be very difficult. I would say this is, a, this is the most edge case I've ever seen. And it's, it's a choice between giving him the degree and sending him away or telling me he has to stay here. And neither of those is a particularly appealing uh, 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 decision I have to make. But let's, uh, uh, Ismail, will you please go away? Yeah. Uh, I, I, maybe I can, let me see. I don't go know away, from my Ismail. phone. I may be able to send you into a room, which is, and I will try to find a steel go to, room. Go to the neutral room. It's like <laughs> yeah, no, that's exactly. I like neutral room better, Raph. Neutral yeah. zone is too Star yeah. Trek for me. I, um, yeah. Okay, I, I don't think my phone is, and, and I, you know, like I say, my entire house uh, blinked right. out. Uh, I don't think my phone, so can you, uh, I don't know, can you log like off and then log back on and I'll let you in okay. when we have reached a decision? Then, yeah, then I'll just basically stay in your waiting room and just let me in whenever you're done. Yes, if you would, if you would do that, I'd appreciate it. Matt Gordon, can you hear me? Yes, Matt I Gordon. Can. Can you stop the stream? Because yep. otherwise, cut Ismail might be able to listen in on our secret confab. Oh, that would be <laughs> terrible. I'll cut right into a uh, hold screen here, so everybody. Yeah, dude. Stream. I hope it's. I hope it's you dancing.
I'm going to say hi to my parents. <laughs> Good. That is the neophyte. Uh, that is the neophyte aesthetic. Everyone is... watching, hold tight, and we'll be, uh, we'll be right back. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Thanks a lot.
I'm sorry it's not April 1st, because then I could pull your leg and tell you we had decided not to give you your MFA. But uh, uh, as regretful as I am to have to say it, you are now the possessor of a terminal degree, uh, uh, the MFA in creative writing. Don't let them kid you that the PhD matters. Um, and uh, uh, we, we will uh, we'll pass around the paper. But it is it is, uh, uh, you know, it's it's all over, but for the weeping. So, yeah, well done. Thank and, you. And uh, awesome. and congratulations. Thank you. And I well, want to really thank all of you. Obviously, like this is um, I have my favorite people, honestly, like for this program. And I feel like, you know, just it's 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 honestly genuine when I look at how much I, I can kind of like signal how much I've learned and grew in this program by just looking at each one of you honestly and well, I, you dropped my workshop the first semester right i know i was like back home and they were like they wouldn't even pay for my uh tuition let's not go there <laughs> <laughs> i never knew that. what i never knew what I happened had, i just knew you disappeared yeah like i had a nightmare i was told that you know i was threatened that you know i'm gonna be kicked out and like you know if i didn't show up and all that stuff like i just it's not going through it which, which, which you know uh, it was it was very interesting and like taught me a lot of lessons about academia and i don't know why i'm going for a phd but i am and i want to Thank you for all your recommendation that as I got into two places and I'm going to be, you know, you know, hopefully, hopefully deciding very soon uh, on how it works and seeing if, you know, it's, I'm going to be able to like move. But I, you know, a lot of people say this stuff out there and say like, you know, I couldn't do stuff without other people, but I, I know I couldn't have done this without you and without your help, your recommendation letters, your definitely help. I can definitely see how I became a better writer and I thought about my my fiction differently. And I don't know, I just think about all these conversations. I don't think it's craft conversations. I think it was all these conversations about stories and what makes stories and how stories work. And, and that I feel like I'm immensely grateful and I'll forever carry those with me for sure. And we'll be, using, good. We'll be using them to torture my students too. I'm <laughs> like, this is what you gotta do. What is the plot? <laughs> it's not a story. <laughs> Uh, all right yeah. well you're part of the family now so yeah. please the the one thing we discussed and it, you know and i i won't keep you because you've got to go uh celebrate but the 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 biggest thing we discussed as a as a panel was that you're going to need continuing mentorship um and for myself i you know i volunteer me and like i say i i've already volunteered matt uh, and I, you know, I volunteer whatever resources we're, you know, moving into the CVEX soon. And I, you know, and you are more than welcome to avail yeah. yourself of, of whatever we have here. No, I really appreciate it. I definitely, my, my fiction will never, I'm not, I, I kid you not. I spend six hours every day on Chan GBT. I kid you oh, not. I, I, use I, it every day. I feel like I'm just addicted now and like, I can never write something without, kind of like having a conversation about it. And I feel like this is the assistant that I, or the mentor that I have always wanted. I'm not saying it, it writes writing my story. It's helping me tell my stories. No, 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 it, it can't write your story. Hurt. It won't do it. I. That's one of those silly headline things that does not fit the reality of AI. Yeah. But AI as collaborator is, yeah. I mean, it's the best collaborator I've ever had. It clarifies um, my thoughts. It makes me feel like I think about the stories more. It offers critiques. Sometimes even like, I, and I'm not saying it's always accurate. It's not. Sometimes it's painful. Sometimes it's, you know, like judgmental and, and racist. And sometimes it is so many different things about it. But I just feel like what you said about it being much more different in six months, I believe it. Like, I believe this is going to be the way we move forward with, with a lot of things and and a person, lot of I can't things. I can't see myself moving forward without kind of like tiptoeing around it and like working with it which I I I couldn't have done this without you opening that resources for me free of charge I'm forever grateful well I will leave you I will leave you on the team so that you have uh, you continue to have access to it thank you I thought right, that very good. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, thank you, my colleagues, and uh, you. Uh, you know, I will leave the room open, but uh, so you may stay as long as you like. But I am going to. I'm going to depart. And congratulations, uh, Ismail and Matt thank Gordon. You, as always, you, Matt. your producer yeah, you, jobs. Matt, Matt yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you. Excited for your excited for your thesis defense in one hour. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh, it really is an hour, isn't it? Okay. And all right. Ismail, I am literally always just an email away. 
Yeah. Like always, you can always email me always, always, always. I can give you my Gmail too, please. I would love to be a part of whatever, whatever success. I just want to bask in it for you. I'm so excited for your success. So thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. You you definitely know where I came from and, and I don't know, I just definitely look at my stories and editing them and like moving forward with the stuff yeah I'm, I'm immensely grateful and i can't wait to be just like sending you these like you know submissions and acceptance and stuff because i've, I've been getting them and i'm like secretly uh-huh. kind of like i'm like wow is it finally working is it finally happening yes. and yes. i'm like yeah like i'm 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 very grateful for you and and pk like i can't i can't tell you how much my story writing has changed by just taking your class um the novel the the screenplay and the uh the short film i I feel like I know now how to write a story and that kind of like wasn't something I've had before your class. So I appreciate you and I appreciate you being part of it and being a mentor, first of all, for anything else. We're in this for life. We all yeah. are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Very Thank good. you. Thank you all. And see Bye. you soon. Yeah. Bye-bye.